Hello, Mr. Shwetpijit, please turn off your video. Hello, Suresh sir. We shall start in next three minutes. Okay. Ah, sure, yeah. <laughs> okay. Onil, please turn off your video. Onil, Onil Naik and Rahul Gautam, please turn off your video. Rahul Gautam, please turn off your video. Thank you. So, Suresh sir, you are ready? Sir, you are mute. Suresh sir, you are mute. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. So, so Gautam and Swapnil, are you ready? Yeah, so much. We shall, we shall yeah. start now, I think. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. Ah. So, let, let us share our video now, me, so Gautam and uh, Swapnil. So, thank, so, good morning to all of you and uh, welcome all for this webinar too. 
which will be delivered by our S. Suresh Kumar sir from DMRT Observatory in Sierra TIFR. So before I formally, I should start the, uh, the proceedings, may I first request Shapnil to say a few words about this particular idea because it is his mastermind that who first, first proposed this first uh, web, this webinar series on this radio telescope. So Shapnil, please go yeah. ahead. Yes, sir. Sir, so the basic idea of this webinar is that most of the RF and microwave engineers are uh, not uh, knowing the things of these applications in astronomy and astro astrophysics that how we can use that uh, microwave knowledge in detecting the planets and uh, all the things. So the idea was started during that RCRS conference when I was present as an exhibitor. So I got interaction with uh, several scientists and was uh, amazed by knowing that yes we can do these kind of activities by using our RF knowledge so uh, we just thought to share this knowledge among all RF engineers microwave engineers who are more uh, working on uh, antenna design RF electronic circuit design and uh, radar applications so this will be very much fruitful for them to look forward and uh, just get another direction about uh, the field of these applications and as this field is uh, very much basic level that astrophysics and astrophysics is, is uh, like having a fundamental core in it so you, if that fundamental gets co uh, get cleared it, in, it involves all the applications like there is antennas then transport systems and everything so if that fundamental is getting cleared then uh, I hope that this knowledge will be helpful for the RF engineers in any domain uh, which we are working at higher frequency. So yeah, I guess I hope that this will be very much fruitful for all, all of you. And I would also like to thank you for all the participants and the speaker to present at this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. May, may I now request Shogoto to say a few words. And Shogoto is also uh, that uh, he is also incidentally working under Suresh Kumar sir in the same lab in GMRT. So may I just request Shogoto to say a few words before we start? Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, thank you so much. So, first of all, uh, Swapnil gave an idea like, like everybody you know that Swapnil is the main mastermind of this webinar series. So, Thanks, so who are who are attending already attending the previous one, previous lecture, which is given by Professor Yashwan Gupta. So now you give an understanding that what is going on, what is radio astronomy, and uh, what are the functionality, all these parts of it. But now, like a if you want to know it briefly, like you have to understand uh, what are the systems is involved or uh, what are the antenna performance. So that's why Suresh Kumar sir is a person who can describe you. Like he can also teach me that what are the, what are the antenna parameters, how the RF electronics and also the signal transport. Uh, basically a front end electronics, whatever the plot from is in antenna uh, from the trans signal transport level up to, up, uh, up to the uh, optical fiber communications, all these things. How it will be happen, or what is the procedure? He will be. I think that that's an interesting session, and it's a very interesting session also. You can learn so many things during the uh, during this two hours time. So, yes. sir, please. Okay. So before before sure. introduction, yeah. So before before I will request sir. So let me just formally introduce Suresh Kumar sir. Uh, in fact, incidentally, I also had carried out my master's thesis in GMRT in long back in 2007, 2008 under his able guidance and I'm very much fortunate to have him um, as one of my supervisor over there. So Mr. S. Suresh Kumar has received his BSc in physics from University of Madras followed by BTEC and MTech from Anna University and College of Engineering Pune respectively. He is currently working as Engineer F in GMRT, in GMRT TIFR. He has a professional experience of more than 28 years and serving as the current group head for fiber optics of the GMRT observatory under NCRA TIFR. And he's also working as current group heads for feeds, front end systems, and RFI mitigation groups. He has worked in RF over fiber for both DWDM and CWDM applications, along with long haul gigabit internet link, CWDM based long haul GBE fiber optic link for data transport. Apart from his fundamental research on antenna feeds and receiver electronics, as deputation, he has visited Jodrell Bank Radio Telescope Observatory, Astron University of Calgary, NRAO, University of Mexico, and Fast Telescope. He designed he designed a low cost switch, switchable 16 beam former using Butler matrix for Mexart project. 
Instituto de Geofisa Unam, Mexico. Further, he was involved in installation of IRNSS, Indian Regional Navigational Satellite System of ISRO at GMRT in an EMI shielded container. He has worked as a consultant and technical member for ECIL, EMSYS, LNT Mysore, ST Radar Aris, SCA. So uh, may I just request uh, Suresh Kumar said to start his talk. Yeah, good morning, everybody. And uh, thanks for the kind uh, introduction. And uh, as uh, Sopnil mentioned, that uh, this talk is mainly addressed to have the basics uh, that has gone into the radio astronomy building, radio telescope building. Mostly what we do is we go behind equations and we talk in equations regarding antenna design, signal uh, processing, and so many things related to astronomy. But what is the application behind those beautiful derivations done, uh, the mathematical derivations, which has gone into building a radio telescope is what will be presented here. So that everybody feels homely with the radio telescope, even though it could be new for uh, certain uh, uh, engineers and uh, the research people. So my interest is that to start a slow uh, from the basic and then introduce you to all these uh, technical or the technology used in building a radio telescope in antenna design in RF electronics and the fiber optic system uh, in building a radio telescope that is the aim of this and since the time is too short I can't go much deep into it but I can make you something useful at the end of the talk you can carry it and you can go back and refer and continue to your area of interest. With that introduction, I'll go to my first slide. So my interest was like antennas. I spent some 30 minutes, 20 minutes for RF electronics, 30 minutes for signal transport system, and you are kind questions for 10 minutes. OK, let us talk uh, something on antennas first. The radio telescope naturally means you need an antenna. And we all know that a dipole antenna is a very common. So you put an antenna and an electronic electromagnetic radiation is incident on the antenna. They produce electric currents in those antenna elements and you try to receive it. So this is the, you can call it as an antenna as a sensor of electromagnetic radiation. Now what happens is you can put this, a simple dipole antenna at the prime focus of a parabolic dish antenna. Like you have a satellite dish, uh, you have a horn antenna put there. You can put even a dipole antenna at the focus uh, using a parabolic uh, dish. Where what happens is the radio astronomy signal which comes from space, they are very distant objects. So these radiations come parallel rays. They incident on a parabolic dish and they try to collimate and point uh, focus at a point which at, at which you are feed is located. So that is the idea of putting a parabolic dish and a dipole at the prime focus. So with that, and go to the next slide. A dipole, if you see that, it is a resonant antenna, which means that the length of the dipole element, we normally keep around lambda by two. Lambda is the wavelength of the frequency of your interest. So since it is being resonant, okay, it will tune it more of resist you and less of reactive part at that resonant frequency. And we see the written laws in your uh, uh, network analyzer tuning well at those resonant frequencies. But the thing is that we will be worried about having a bandwidth to it. Normally a dipole tunes at a frequency sharply tuned but we wanted to have a wide coverage. So what decides that is the thickness of the antenna. When you increase the thickness of the element, what happens is the Q value gets reduced. Okay. So with that, the impedance slowly varies from the resonant frequency. So you can achieve a wide band dipole antenna by having a thicker dipole elements. That doesn't mean that you should have a uh, solid, uh, heavyweight 
dipo long basically the surface is what important to us you can have a uh, hollow cylinders which can be used as a dipole element but still thick enough to get the bandwidth but when you use a thin wire the q is too high and the impedance changes uh, very fast with frequency uh, okay so i am introducing a thing that how do you get a broader band feed and other thing is that normally a dipole is bagged with a ground plane when you simulate in various em simulation software you put a infinite ground plane or a finite ground plane same way at a distance of quarter wavelength like lambda by 4 you put a ground plane below a dipole element okay and this helps in boosting your front to back ratio of the dipole okay and you are and um, the forward gain is improved so you use a reflector at the, below the dipole at the distance of lambda by 4 now introducing you to next level so we discussed about dipole making it wider and then we discussed about reflector now we think that when we connect a coaxial cable to a dipole element for example you need to have a balance you remember in olden days uh, we used to have this yagiuda antenna and a balance attached behind your uh, tv so you have a parallel wire line coming in whereas the tv input is a 75 ohms coaxial so you need the parallel wire is a balanced line and the coaxial wire uh, cable is a um, unbalanced line so you need a balance to do it so this balance it tries to match the balanced line to a unbalanced line a dipole is a balanced system and you the elements two elements or two arms of a dipole needs to have equal current flow when you feed it or when you receive it equal current flow enters into the connector but how do you do it when you put a coaxial cable the coaxial cable has a center conductor and an outer conductor the center conductor what happens is puts the current to one element of the dipole and the outer conductor sees two paths to the other element two paths in the sense the current flows through the inner side of the outer conductor as well as the current flows to the <coughs> sorry to the outer side of the outer conductor but this current actually try to cancel little bit and you get a lesser current on the other element to do that you have to cancel this current flowing on the outer side of the outer uh, shield of the coaxial cable so that is what is being done by a balan the balan not only this it has one more thing that um, sometimes you may have to change the impedance like you need to have a 4 is to 1 balan like the impedance is higher you have to try to get it to 50 ohms okay so you can use a 4 is to 1 to 1 or 80 uh, 8 is to 1 and like that you have with the impedance transformer also uh, as well as you can have 50 to 50 ohms impedance transformation but with a balance to unbalance combination so a balan does so many things uh, behind the dipole when you use a coaxial cable and not only that this balan improves your return loss of the dipole which means that the vswr to be frank next let us talk about the polarization you know that uh, like your tv antenna you keep the antenna horizontal not a vertical because the tv transmission is in a horizontal plane okay so the when the electric field as you see that uh, small video going behind okay the electric field should be parallel to the elements and only those electric field will try to induce current in your dipole okay so now if your electric field is perpendicular to it it won't induce a current into the dipole this is what we call it as two orthogonally orthogonal linear polarized signals called as horizontal and vertical element same way this horizontal and vertical element when they are in equal amplitude and they are 90 degree out of phase between them and you try to combine it you get a circular polarization okay in the circular polarization again based on the horizontal polarization leading or lagging the vertical component okay you can get a left or a right circular polarization in your antenna okay not only that when you try to receive a circular polarized signal 
and you try to receive in a linear as vertical and horizontal you see a 3 db reduction suppose you transmit a 0 db signal and you to circular polarize and you try to receive in a linear you get minus 3 and minus 3 dbm uh, in the vertical and horizontal okay the same way the other also okay so a linear dipole collects the electrical signal only which is uh, linearly polarized and parallel to the element okay and other thing is that suppose you wanted to uh, receive both a vertical and a horizontal uh, signal you have to have a cross dipole cross dipole in the sense that you should have a vertical uh, element and a horizontal element which receives both the uh, electric field in both the planes okay and that is how the cross pole cross dipole designs are explored for various applications you can get simultaneous vertical and horizontals then there is an another one suppose you happen to use a horn antenna okay the incoming signal is a circular polarized you can use an orthomo transducer which splits this circular polarized signal into a vertical polarized signal and a horizontal polarized signal okay this is one another application when you wanted to do it you have to go behind orthomo transducer behind a horn antenna okay this is one another application then polarization isolation that is another thing how pure is your signal in polarization suppose you have a vertical plane uh, reception and you try to transmit in horizontal and try to receive in vertical it should be ideally speaking no signal in the vertical because they are of orthogonal polarizations okay same way in circular polarization right circular versus left circular there should be an isolation normally this cross polar isolation is 20 db and above okay this is also an important parameter in a radio telescope which needs to be considered the polarization purity that is one of the parameter <clears throat> then the antenna temperature okay so you know that the receivers are uh, told in terms of system temperature t cis you would have heard about it okay you take an lna or a receiver system we tell them it is so many kelvin okay for the easy of uh, receiver analysis what they have done is that the they have included the antenna signal the signal received by the antenna okay when a signal incident on it per unit frequency and converted it into antenna temperature which means that it is the temperature of the match receiver whose thermally generated power per unit frequency equals that produced by the antenna so whatever signal is received by the antenna you try to put a match resist, uh, resistor and what is the temperature generated by it for the incident unit power per frequency and that is called as antenna temperature so this is the term used in the radio astronomy even in satellite systems they use this so antenna temperature and receiver temperature now it is easy to work with the same convention so antenna temperature is one of the unit which is used in uh, radio astronomy <coughs> other thing is sensitivity we know that the rf engineers know it is uh, like signal to noise ratio okay here uh, the sensitivity of a telescope is uh, mentioned in so many kelvins per jansky okay which means that um, uh, what is um, uh, the temperature the antenna has received uh, or the signal it has received for the incident uh, radio astronomy signal it is like that so this depends not only the dish diameter or the gain of the antenna it depends on the how much power is incident on the solid beam of the final dish okay the entire beam is not illuminated by the source okay so there is a fraction of the beam is actually illuminated by the source okay so that fraction is important that's why the antenna temperature equals the bright source brightness temperature multiplied by the fraction of the beam solid angle filled by the source okay the source is uh, it doesn't fill the full um, uh, solid angle of the dish 
or the antenna. So the sensitivity goes like Kelvin's per Jansky. And then gain of the antenna, let us uh, think it is a parabolic dish, normally a large collective area. So the parabolic dish is considered here. Okay. So this in um, what you call the main part of gain is that the effective collecting area of the dish. The larger the collective area, you have a better gain. But there is one another benefit you can call here is the larger the gain, the beam width becomes narrower. Okay. So that is the uh, important thing in the astro astronomy, radio astronomy, which is used there. But one thing you should remember that building a larger telescope okay at low frequencies okay because the area is larger you can collect more radio astronomy signal with that but for a higher frequencies the dipoles or the antenna itself is too small but the collective area is too less okay so building a larger area is not a feasible uh, thing for a high frequency like application so people go for uh, different uh, designs okay we have to increase the collective area like you can have an array of dipoles spread over a large distance okay or um, uh, other uh, uh, array of uh, parabolic dishes okay so the array telescopes actually help in building a larging, larger collective area at lower frequencies so the collective area is increasing is very easier for the lower frequency coming to the parabolic dish there are interesting things in a parabolic dish and GMRT antenna is one of that excuse me Suresh sir just just give, give me one second Rajesh Kumar please keep your video off we have told repeatedly Rajesh Kumar please keep your video off Okay, so the parabolic dish, uh, the main advantage of a parabolic dish is that it has high directivity. As I told you, the beam is uh, very much pointed and highly directional. Another thing is that the parabolic dish are high gain antennas and they produce a narrow beam width. And <clears throat> a parabolic reflector normally gives a 30 to 40 dB uh, gain. Okay, that is why people are behind the parabolic reflectors. And uh, beam width can be calculated by this formula like 70 d by lambda. It not only depends on the frequency but the diameter of the dish. <coughs> Sorry. The, there is one another interesting parameter is that how big you can build a dish. Okay. There is a limitation for that. Uh, you have to optimize a factor called f by d ratio. f is the focal length of the dish. So this is one another parameter which has to be optimized, which depends on, if you see the graph, a parabolic dish and the aperture efficiency in the Y graph, Y side. Okay. Percentage efficiency, that is the aperture efficiency. The aperture efficiency is to its maximum from 0.4 to 0.5. So people try to accommodate the F by D ratio around this range to maximize the aperture gain. Not only that, at this place, you have a feed blockage, feed illumination, okay, all are high and spillover efficiency, okay, is also better here. So that is how the 0.4 to 0.5 is a F by D ratio, which is selected for radio astronomy, even for the other applications. But in radio astronomy, this is one another parameter when you try to build a parabolic dish. And then a tapering. So what happens is um, when you build a parabolic dish with a feed there, it has beam called as main beam, okay, or the main lobe. Not only that, it has side lobes also, okay. These side lobes, for example, in astronomy, a point source like measure falls mainly on the main beam. So there is no problem. We are able to detect the measure easily with the radio telescope, but the other source like 21 centimeter H1 emission is present everywhere and that also will get picked up by the side lobe. So it is very important in a radio telescope that 
this side lobe is kept low how do you do that your feed pattern you should shrink it so that it cuts at the edge of the receiver edge of the dish at some db low for example the center c is a 0 db point you like a 10 or 12 db down the edge of the receiver receiver should show which means that you are under illuminating the main dish <coughs> sorry so by under illuminating the main dish <coughs> you are able to reduce the side lobe level and prevent the receiver temperature increase with the side lobe so tapering is one of the parameter in designing a radio telescope that needs to be considered antenna efficiency factors few of them which are very important i have mentioned here like spillover efficiency it's a radiation goes out of the dish you can say simple word the aperture efficiency we discuss it depends on the illumination of the dish by the feed we are talking about a reflector antenna or what you call a receiving type of antenna that is why i said that the aperture efficiency is illumination of the dish okay uh, in in terms of transmitter antenna it it one and the same like how do you illuminate from the feed to the dish so that is how this uh, reciprocity of the antenna matters so aperture efficiency talks about the illumination of the dish then surface error of the dish suppose you are assuming a parabolic dish it should be a perfect parabola if there are ups and downs okay or the surface doesn't fall in that profile of the parabola then you will see that different phase phase changes at the uh, focus point so this you call it as a surface error and you lose efficiency then aperture blockage blockage like you have the prime focus feed at the top of the dish and the support structures to the feed all these thing will block the signal from the space and you call it as a blockage blockage of the dish in a simple term you can say that it will cause a shadow on the dish and that is called as blockage uh, of the dish and the efficiency depends on that blockage then the polarization okay the polarization you are receiving it should match the incoming polarization and the other thing is that in low frequency what happen in a parabolic dish the point of focus will be normally a, a point at the prime focus but in meter wave length they are not point they are little larger feed okay so there is reduction in efficiency due to the size of the feed at the prime focus another thing is that which uh, normally uh, not mentioned is that a mesh leakage where if you don't have a solid reflector surface and you try to put a mesh like in gmrt observatory then some kind of some part of the signal will mesh leak through the mesh okay at higher frequencies of course because the mesh is designed for a lower frequency but still not 100% for the design frequency so there is a percentage of leakage through the mesh and we call that as a mesh leakage and other thing is that the prime focus or the focus point of the parabolic dish it it should match the face center of the feed antenna also okay and this error if the feed is not placed exactly at the prime focus position face center okay from where the radiations converge to the where the radiation converges from the dish okay then there is a phase error and efficiency is lost so what we do is we try to move the feed up and down <coughs> sorry above the reflector so that the efficiency is increased okay so this kind of tuning is done either automated or manually and we optimize every feed for this application this one another interesting thing in radio astronomy is that okay i build a very big radio telescope and what is my angular resolution suppose there are two stars in the sky how easily i can pinpoint one after the other 
if my antenna beam is larger these two stars will appear as a small as a single single star okay this is what in simple term angular resolution so building a larger dish a better angular res uh, resolution uh, but what happens is even you build a 100 meter telescope where i mentioned that Eiffelsberg, one of the example uh, the slide reference i have given there so that has only eight arc minutes as angular resolution but a human eye is much better than that which is 17 arc seconds imagine to get to that level or down that you need a much larger telescope okay which is literally not possible so there comes a solution what is known as radio interferometry what they do is they try to take two antenna separate them at a distance say in this show slide showed 30 kilometer distance okay and the angular resolution is 1.22 lambda by b b is a distance between these separated telescope when the distance is larger the angular resolution is very good so and it comes to like one arc second for a 30 kilometer dish uh, separation so this is equivalent to a 30 kilometer dish antenna to get this finer angular resolution so this is the advantage taken by the radio astronomers in building an interferometry based radio telescope to get a very finer angular resolutions to study these intercelestial things there is one another technique <clears throat> i'll come to you aperture synthesis aperture synthesis aperture synthesis is that suppose i have two antenna i get a 30 kilometer uh, diameter dish but as earth rotates these antennas also change their these antennas also change their um, locations and you end up in um, uh, what do you call multiple baselines as earth rotates how you get multiple baselines i will demonstrate here <clears throat> the baseline for a source for a source okay with the earth rotation in the one slide you can see the two antenna with the earth rotation at some distance when the earth <coughs> sorry when the earth rotates the distance between these two antennas okay with respect to the source the it changes you get a different baseline like that as the earth rotates the baseline keeps changing and you get uh, at various baselines various resolutions and various recording of the same source okay or multiple recordings of the same source and this is called as aperture synthesis for example we the image you can see that there are two antennas and you get this um, uh, what do you call beads or the fringes between them due to interferometry but as earth rotates for a three antenna system you get that n is three and you can around six outputs you get and you try to process it you will get a very clean uh, uh, what do you call uh, field pattern and the image c you can see and image d <clears throat> image d is uh, like a four antenna system okay where you have uh, multiple baselines again and you get uh, so many outputs and um, you get the field pattern improved much okay so this is what aperture synthesis you have n telescopes you will have n into n minus 1 baselines and each baseline adds a Fourier component to the image and improve the quality okay increasing the number of telescopes increasing the sensitivity of the array so an array has uh, many telescopes okay you will have many baselines and you will have uh, better sensitivity and uh, this one the reference i have given you can go through on this uh, lectures other thing i want to mention is sir martin ryle he is the person i mean the scientist who actually found this uh, earth rotation based um, aperture synthesis and he was offered nobel prize and uh, you can go through that okay now let us come to gmrt so gmrt now i have told about a parabolic dish 
and GMRT is a 45 meter diameter and of 30 dishes and it has an array of 30 antennas. They are spread over radial distance of 14 kilometer, a total of 28 kilometer diameter. So you can synthesize an aperture synthesis of 28 kilometers with this Y-shaped 30 antenna array of GMRT. Now you can understand why it is Y shape, I mean why the array is there, why number of antennas, why 45 meter dish, all those things. Okay. Now <clears throat> what happens is you have various feed designs. I was telling you dipole designs. Yes, GMRT uses dipoles, but they use cross dipoles. Okay. So cross dipoles with a reflector at lambda by four, as I told you. But these deflectors are a little special. <coughs> In one design, we are used a <clears throat> plane deflector. In another, we use a conical deflector. And the third one also a little different angle of conical deflector. You can see the written loss of the feed. Not only that, you can see a ring about that 130 to 260 megahertz feed. This actually improves the E and H pattern or it compresses the H pattern and try to equalize the H pattern to the E pattern. So you get a, what do you call a perfect circular polarization when you try to combine the E and H. Okay. So that is one of the application here. The vertical lines from the cross dipole, they are the actual balance. Okay. Quarter wave transformers. Okay. They are the coaxial balance, which are integrated with this dipole. What you see the vertical lines there. Okay. And then the conical reflector actually helps you have equal taper if taper at over the bandwidth. See, these are thick dipole, thick and crossed, but getting a wide bandwidth is what the application. But when you make a wide bandwidth, doesn't mean that you get your radiation pattern everywhere same. Okay. So, but when you try to use a conical reflector, what happens is the taper, which has to match the parabolic dish where it cuts the edge of the reflector. I call it as taper efficiency. I mean, or the taper level. Okay, that is equal when you try to make a conical reflector. That is how the conical reflector helps in getting a balanced pattern or an equal pattern at all frequencies for a wide band feed. Then we have one frequency, a L band frequency. We have a coaxial, uh, what do you call a horn, basically a corrugated horn. As I told you, it has an integrated OMT. I told you what is OMT. It actually, the signal is received in circular polarization and this OMT splits them into vertical and horizontal. And this is the, the tubular structure behind the horn is the OMT. Okay. So this is what the, we were discussing earlier. And the corrugation has its, again, an application to shape its um, side lobe levels and pattern. Then we want to replace this again, uh, uh, horn antenna to again cross dipole antenna because this cross dipole field feed offers very good uh, radiation pattern over the larger bandwidth. Okay, so this is again a cross dipole with a conical reflector, and the box below is the front end electronics or the LNA behind the dipole, and this is a feed. I think now I need not tell what are these components because we have discussed it. Okay, there are other designs also we have explored, which is a legacy system of GMRT. We have used a thick dipole, okay, a thick folded dipole, the one which is 150 megahertz, which I mentioned, and in chord configurations, like two dipoles are combined for horizontal polarization and two dipoles are combined for a particular polarization and a sub reflector is provided. And then you have cross dipole and then we have a coaxial field. You would have heard a multi frequency horn antenna, but in GMRT we are used multi-frequency coaxial feed. Basically it is a coaxial design. The center portion, the center two circles represents the 16 megahertz performance and the center one and the outer bigger circle represents the 235 megahertz circle, uh, 235 megahertz uh, antenna performance. So it is a dual frequency feed, okay, which was used earlier for GMRT. And this also has probes, okay, like uh, quarter wavelength probes behind the waveguide, okay, where it senses the horizontal polarization, vertical polarization, and that also again passes through a balance and then kind of gets to the system later. <coughs> now, 
then feed optimization so once you make a feed how do you put in a dish okay we try to first optimize for a wider bandwidth in the feed design but other thing is taper over the feed bandwidth so you can see the second graph which shows that around 12 db okay the taper power level is seen over the bandwidth which is 252 500 megahertz feed this is the performance obtained after we using a conical reflector in the design and this 12 db power of the radiation part of the feed cuts exactly at the edge of the parabolic dish which is about 62.5 degrees and then feed optimization i told you phase center we have the first graph shows that the feed was moved up and down and we have studied a deflection with the source the best deflection point has been recorded and maintained to optimize the phase center and this is the final deflection after placing the phase center is the sensitivity shown in the second graph so with this i complete the uh, antenna feed designs i don't know how much time i covered now we'll move to front end electronics you can post your questions to the committee members and we can handle it through your chat you can do it okay now we have seen the dish we have seen the antenna now signal all the way comes from the prime focus to the antenna base and uh, <clears throat> and to do that immediately after the feed there is a front end electronics so the before the signal reaches the antenna base you have to process it or you have to what do you call signal um, quality has to be um, improved okay so our certain um, signal processing is done analog signal processing done there so you see this block diagram which is generally common to all radio astronomy receivers so this antenna is shown there and you have a polarizer which i was telling it as um, i will show you the polarizer actually combines two linear polarizations and you get a circular polarized signals which is fed to the lna you can see after channel 1 you can see the low noise amplifier okay when the lna receives a signal then you select you want to see a full bandwidth okay by passing through straight to the bandpass filter or you wanted a chunks of bands of the feed sometimes you wanted to have a higher resolutions you take a narrow bandwidth and pass it to the digital system where it is um, a smaller bandwidth is spectral channels are used to increase the spectral resolutions <coughs> sorry so <clears throat> we have sub band filters when you wanted you can make it like 100 megahertz or 120 megahertz chunks of filters okay and reduce the bandwidth and take it out and then before the lna there is a direction coupler uh, above the channel 1 you can see in the image okay it used to inject a calibrated noise source suppose there is no astronomy signal uh, available to test your system you can fire a noise signal at which is placed along with the system and feed into the receiver and check your system not only that you before observing a radio astronomy signal you should ensure that your system is not saturated with the radio astronomy signal for example and observing a <clears throat> galaxy or a <clears throat> star or whatever maybe and the sun is different the sun is quite stronger source naturally your receiver gets saturated so by firing this noise source <clears throat> you have to ensure that whether your signal is in linear range and it will be able to see a difference or a deflection with the celestial what you call radio astronomy signal so that is also it is used okay so this noise sources normally is switched on and off to see the system linearity performance and calibration purpose and then you have um, rf termination facility for debugging and a gain block okay you have post amplification stages okay and then uh, you have a swap switch swap switch basically which swaps the channel 1 and channel 2 sometimes what happen when you try to do maintenance in an antenna and each antenna has like around four or five bands and uh, two polarizations each and we have 30 antennas suppose one of the channel is reversed in an antenna 
you don't correlate between them between other antenna source signal so you can't go up and change the polarization or you can you can't go to the antenna and swap the cable so there is a swap facility where you can swap the signal and try to continue your observation of the uh, source okay and later you can correct it not only that you can debug the system uh, error whether the fault if the antenna is not functioning whether the fault is before the um, uh, what about signal transport system or in the front end system by swapping the ch channels you can identify okay so all these features are there and there are rf monitoring systems uh, which actually you monitor the temperature and rf at the front end system which is placed at the prime focus of the feed okay coming to the next slide the polarizer i was tell, uh, telling you it is a i didn't get a slide so i just made a rough pen drawing you can see that the v and h signals are entering in the polarizer has a power splitter basically it splits the power into two parts <clears throat> one part goes to the combiner state other part okay goes to with a 90 degree phase shift to the other combiner okay same way h polarization does the other way so when you tie combine yeah v polarization directly and h polarization with a 90 degree phase shift you get a channel one polarization and the other way is channel two and this is how you try to get from the linear polarized signal received by the feed you try to convert it into circular polarized as right circular and left circular polarization with the polarizer this is the reason for putting a polarizer immediately after the feed and before the lna certainly the noise uh, increases because there is a lossy component before the lna <clears throat> these are noise definitions i think people who are working on rf and uh, should be knowing all this i don't want to go through it uh, lna uh, as i told you that why lna is important lna you know that it is a low noise amplifier it is not a normal amplifier the amplifier itself should contribute lesser noise into the re receiver system <clears throat> okay if the amplifier itself adds this noise then you can you will increase the receiver temperature okay or the tsis and you won't be able to see the weak radio astronomy signal secondly is that this lna is sits immediately next to the feed you can say like a feed is connecting cable polarizer and the lna it comes so the loss between the feed and the lna input should be very very less because the first stage you happen to have a larger loss the which can be corrected later okay it's a damage then already you can see same way you try to add a noise of the first stage okay it's amplified and amplified down the chain and you lose the system temperature so the first stage in a receiver of radio astronomy system should be a low noise amplifier and the loss before the lna should be less okay other thing is that not only low noise amplifier should have a very good gain so that any further amplifiers added with high noise doesn't affect the noise performance higher the gain from the first equation you can understand the first gain is important to reduce the noise figure of the succeeding changes stages and the stability of the antenna and the linearity is important i will tell you <clears throat> this slide normally these things are not told to a lna designer when it is astronomy okay and or any other application these are the things which i try to tell our people you should keep in mind any lna which tries to work right at the first stage is not a good lna okay it, it it could oscillate okay it will have so many drawbacks but these are the quick checks you should ensure that your lna is perfect one thing is that people try to check the input return loss not the output return loss that is one another thing so when you cascade the subsequent stage to the lna it doesn't match the second stage it's poor <coughs> and people always try to see the s11 of the lna and they don't see s22 of the lna okay and other thing is that s11 is very important because the feed it is getting connected to the lna or the polarizer which is getting connected to the lna they should have a very good matching if this matching is not perfect this lna will try to oscillate and not only it oscillates because of the polarizer it gets coupled 
the channel one LNA is oscillating, it gets coupled to the second channel also. And above all, this oscillation will be sometimes radiated to adjacent antennas in the array also. Or so this way, it is a like cascading effect. It keeps going. So better to ensure that the S1 and of the antenna is very good so that it matches feed and the polarizer very well. Okay. And the, don't ignore the S22 because S22 is important how it interfaces with the subsequent gain stages or the subsequent systems. Second one is, <clears throat> yes, we try to increase the gain of the LNA. That's good. But there is one another parameter that the LNA can't give a very high power at its output. Okay, even an op amp, that output power or the voltage depends on the supply. Okay, so the output voltage can't exceed the supply voltage. It's similar to that. The output power, okay, or the output P1 dB specified for a LNA device, it should not be overdriven. You will go into non-linearity. So you should ensure that what is your input power and what gain is your antenna and then see that is it 10 dB below the P1 dB at the output. The output P1 dB okay, should be always 10 dB below so that you don't, you don't generate third order intermodulation product in your system. Okay, So this is a simple thing but people will be so happy to get a higher gain in the system and try to feed in more power and see, okay, I got a high power there, but you don't see any deflection in the radio astronomy because your system is already saturated. Above all, it produces intermodulation product and you think that it could be a radio interference coming from outside and a lot of confusions happen with that. So it's better that to check the output P1dB of the LNA, okay, are we below that, okay? The gain and the input power is decided based on that. Not only that, an LNA is not a single stage. People try to build with two stage, three stage, etc. You should ensure that when you try to amplify the first stage, the amplified output goes to the second stage. If the input first stage is low, but whereas the input to the second stage is high, but the devices are same. So you should ensure that the second stage don't saturate with this high input to it. Okay. So that is one another thing. You should ensure that third and second and third stage did, don't get saturated in a cascaded system. People try to just put the same uh, first stage copied in these three stages and try to uh, couple them with a the capacitor and see, okay, I have increased the gain. But that's not enough. You should ensure that the second and third stage do not saturate. Okay. The other thing is that the output P1 dB remains the same because the device is same. Okay. So you should ensure they don't get into saturation. Not only that, matching between these stages is also to be taken care. Okay. That anyway, that people do. And uh, coming to the other point is that, how do you know that uh, like quick check, not everybody have a noise figure analyzer to check an LNA that, um, uh, it is low noise. Okay, simple thing is you connect to a spectrum analyzer and see the noise flow. Sorry, turn on, turn off the generator, or sorry, turn on, turn off the LNA. You see the noise deflection in the spectrum analyzer. That is sufficient to tell you that, okay, how much is a noise added, okay, or increased. Basically, you can put a signal also and measure the input and output signal to noise ratio with LNA and without LNA and try to estimate the noise figure of the LNA. But the quick check is that correct your spectrum analyzer, turn on and turn off and see whether your LNA is uh, showing response. Other thing is that everybody wanted to build a wide band LNA. Okay. People say my LNA is a 500 megahertz bandwidth. People say 1500 megahertz bandwidth, but they forget to understand that in a radio astronomy, the band of interest, say if it is 500 megahertz, no point in having an LNA going all the way to 1 gigahertz. Why? Because when the LNA is extended to 1 gigahertz, you will invite a lot of interference amplified by the LNA and passed down the chain. Okay. 
So the LNA sees a signal which is out of the band also and you are amplifying it. Okay. So what happens to that? Not only you are passing to it, the input signal level to your antenna also increases and your LNA gets earlier saturation. So you see you put an antenna and um, for example you at 600 and megahertz you are building an antenna it goes all the way to 1200 or 1500 for example but what happens is all this mobile signal which is like at um, 950 and 800 850 etc will fall in the band and they try to saturate your LNA and you see a lot of products coming out of your LNA but the damage has been done with that so it's better that you restrict your band of your interest and no point in having a wider band LNA when your band of interest is less than that. Okay, you are inviting problem and your LNA leads to saturation. Okay, so with that introduction to the LNA and the RF systems, I I uh, introduce you some of the modules designed at uh, GMRT by our engineering team. <coughs> So this is like a 122 250 megahertz LNA, which is built using the hemp device. The, you can see that the gain is around 35 dB, noise temperature of 40 Kelvin, and the return loss over the band is 10 dBm, and OIP3 is plus 20 dB. Same way an LNA at 550 to 900, and the LNA used at GMRT. The interesting thing is that most of the observatory they try to uh, use cooled LNAs to have a low receiver temperature. In GMRP, we don't have the luxury of cooling because the systems are built at a lower cost and um, less of maintenance, of course. Without cooling, the maintenance is less. So all our LNAs are uncooled. And we try to match these cooled LNAs to some extent. You can see this slide. The last blue number, which is like 27 Kelvin and 25 Kelvin, okay, for 800 and 900 megahertz kind of thing. So the room temperature LNA, um, I mean uncooled LNA, you are able to achieve, um, <coughs> uh, sorry, 22 Kelvin, not blue, the uh, red one, <coughs> okay. The temperature goes on like 22 Kelvin, 20 Kelvin and kind of thing. So you are able to achieve a um, low noise temperature in the room uh, temperature itself or operation and that is the success of the uh, design okay there is a three stage LNA you can actually get a higher gain okay and noise temperature is around 32 Kelvin and it is for an L band normally these amplifiers are cooled amplifiers but we have an uncooled amplifier designs other thing is that when we try to put these amplifiers in outdoor environment at the prime focus of a big parabolic dish, you should ensure that the gain or the noise figure of this LNA do not vary with temperature. So this is a characterization. The first graph shows that the noise temperature variation with uh, from 0 degrees to 60 degrees has been done. You can see the bunch line. And when you try to use a low PPM resistor, the bunch still narrows down. And the variation is only like 0.2 dB uh, gain variation you see there. And the noise figure variation is around less than 10 Kelvin or 10 Kelvin over the band and over 0 degree to 60 degree Celsius. So with the ambient temperature, our LNAs are able to have less of gain variation and gain uh, noise temperature variation uh, when they are put in outdoor. That is why I call them as room temperature LNAs. So this is one another parameter one has to check in a radio telescope. So other thing is, as I mentioned you that the cable distance between the feed and the LNA or the front end system should be as to, uh, less as possible. You reduce the cable loss between them, you gain better. Otherwise, you lose your system temperature. What we have done is that in the 550-900 megahertz, your conical cross-dipole antenna, we have brought the front-end receiver exactly below the reflector with a very small cable connection. So this way, we are able to reduce the cable loss and try to improve upon the 
uh, receiver temperature. And other thing is, I told you about the switch bank filters. Yes, this is one of the design. You see the bandpass filter there, and these bands are sliced into four bands of 100 megahertz bandwidth. Okay, you can see the design here. Then there is one another design, meta material design for a low frequency switch bank filter. Okay, so this one, why meta material in the sense that when you try to make a filter for low frequencies, for example, 240 megahertz and 500 megahertz kind of thing, <coughs> sorry, the dimensions are too big. So meta material is one concept by which uh, you can reduce the size of the filters. Okay, so this is all done. There was an IEEE, IEEE publication on this by our colleague Sogoto. You can see it. And then cascaded bandpass filter. Other things that you will see interferences in the radio strand bandwidth could be a TV line, could be a mobile bandwidth, could be a wireless, or could be a satellite interference, or could be a air traffic control signal. Okay, there are uh, what do you call commercial transmissions which can follow your band. You can't ask everybody to be silent there. Okay, so what happens is you try to build notch filters and try to place in cascade with the bandpass filter, you can see that the first one shows the bandpass filter response and a notch filter in the second one. And you see the bandpass response in the signal uh, deflection. So this actually suppresses a TV transmission line, 175 megahertz and 181 megahertz of a Pune TV. And um, you can see the split in the bandpass band, okay? So the thing is that when you try to do it, not only the isolation, you should ensure that you don't degrade the bandpass response of the system. Keep narrower as possible your notch filter uh, in the design. And then noise calibration, as I told you that, so this is a noise calibration beside one of our colleague. So it has like a four levels of noise calibration, a local, medium cal, high cal, and an extra high cal. Basically that feeds noise power instead of the radio signal signal to the LNA for a debugging and a calibration performance. What are the other functions I already discussed? In a front end system, you have a RF band selector. You have in the GMRT, we have like five bands. You have, you can select the front end system one at a time, like a 130 to 260 megahertz band or 250 to 500, a 500 to 900 or an L band system. So you have to switch the bands. So there is a band selector module, a soft switch mo mo uh, module I told. Then there is a voice modulation. This is similar to your spread spectrum technique. What happens is that each channel received by the antenna right at the front end, you try to modulate using voice code or orthogonal codes. So channel one and channel two uses a code. They are orthogonal to each other and each antenna will have different walls codes. So this way, the, they are coded and when they are received for signal processing, we do demodulation of this walls code. So with this, we try to avoid any mutual coupling between channels or between antennas, either outside or in the receiver room or the digital chain or analog chain uh, of the receiver system. So there could be a cross coupling by radiation or by conduction, all those things are avoided with this walls modulation and demodulation, which is implemented in GMRT. It's under a uh, final stage for implementation, uh, for release to be frank. RF termination, I told you. Gain block, when you try to use a gain block, that is after the LNA, you try to put some amplifiers to match down the uh, cable loss or matching the further systems you have to use an amplifier which is having a higher dynamic range. What happens is already an amplified signal, okay, it's again amplified. So the input P1 dB of your gain state should be higher so that it doesn't lead to saturation. Then RF monitoring systems, then control and monitoring like you can operate the band selectors, swap switch, modulation, termination, all those remote control options are the prime focus and for antennas located at remote locations, all done through this control and monitoring system, okay, which is a module is fit into the front end system of any telescope.
So this is for the numbers who are interested, the Spooner free dynamic range, compression range, and the minimum deductible noise signal, all those things, okay? And G by T6 is the figure of merit of any telescope. So we can uh, see that G by T6 is gained by T6, and T6 of every band is mentioned there. And T receiver temperatures are shown at L band 5900 and 250. 500, which is uh, achieved at GMRT. Okay, so with that, we finish the RF system. Again, your questions, you can forward to the committee members. We'll move to now signal transport system. Um, uh, Somak, please uh, tell me how much minutes I left. Yeah, so uh, how much you want? Another 25 minutes? Yeah, please, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, the receiver chain. Uh, now we have discussed about the feed, the front end system. Now what happens is the system from front end goes to a signal transport system. And uh, antenna based receiver is for sometimes you down convert the signal to IF because you are fiber optic chain or the signal transport system, what I call it as a fiber optic chain could be narrow bandwidth. So you should down convert to IF signal and use it. But now current systems, we use a broadband um, <coughs> links. So we don't need basically a broadband receiver, antenna receivers remotely located. So from feed, front end and directly one can go to the fiber optic receiver chain. And from fiber optics transmitter, the, the signal travels all the way over a distance from remote antenna to the central processing station where the fiber optic receiver is located and where the signal is passed on to for further signal processing in the analog and digital backend. Okay, so now we, we are into the third stage of the receiver chain. Okay, signal transport system. <clears throat> this slide I flashed you already. You can see the Y array. The distance is 12, 14 kilometer radial distance, but the fiber route is around 22 kilometer distance. Okay, the faraway antenna is from the central location is about 22 kilometer distance from a few uh, meters or a less than a kilometer to 22 kilometer distance. All antennas are connected through fiber optic link. Okay, and that is the very beginning of GMRT. We try to adopt the fiber optic connectivity uh, in this radio astronomy application. <clears throat> now, what are the RF, uh, I mean the signal transport system I mentioned. So here there are two options, either you can go a digital fiber optic system or an analog fiber optic system. What currently it is implemented is an analog fiber optic system, which is an RF over fiber optic system. And uh, now the first question I put here is digital fiber optic system. Why you can't digitize a signal right at the antenna base and get it over fiber to the signal processing station. Of course, it's good. You can freeze the amplitude and phase and no variations down the chain of the receiver happens, but there is a there are maintenance problems, remotely located systems, plus interference issues by putting a digital systems near to the antenna. <clears throat> so when you put in a shielded room, all these digital systems, you are free of <clears throat> interference and the maintenance is easier synchronization is easier <clears throat> okay so all these things has allowed us to move to rf over fiber and later now we are moving parallel chain for a digital over fiber also that is also on the way maybe quite soon we will come uh, with those results okay rf over fiber uh, it is like a coaxial cable but the signal tra uh, transmits in light okay and the frequency is in terahertz like 190 terahertz is a frequency which the light travels in the fiber. It has a larger bandwidth, wider frequency, high dynamic range, and you know the fiber advantage of signal security, EMI proof, and uh, it's a very native RF format. Directly connect the RF signal. You need not do any formatting in digital like thing. And then easy upgrade possible and multiplexing. Multiplexing in a digital system is easier 
and rf4 fiber we have done much of multiply multiplexing which i'll show you which will be quite interesting to you also okay what is an rf4 fiber optic link it has a basic antenna and a lna in the front end system and a fiber optic transmitter which converts rf to optical and then a photodiode receiver which is optical to rf which is located in the central processing station and an optical fiber cable so this is a common basic block diagram of a rf over fiber you need an optical transmitter you need a optical receiver but what is inside let us see now okay an optical transmitter we see it contains a laser module the laser module is not just a laser it is a laser built in with a monitoring photodiode which taps a part of the laser light and which is used for apc control automatically adjust the laser power and then you have a thermistor to monitor the temperature of the laser and you have a pelcher cooler to cool the laser module all those things put in a module which for an analog uh, receiver it costs around 800 to 1000 dollars now okay a dfb laser with all these features and the circuitry contains a laser driver which actually programs this laser to the desired laser current and then you have an automatic power control which adjusts the optical power of the laser by adjusting the current with the laser driver then you have a thermoelectric cooler controller which utilizes the special cooler and thermistor and try to sense the temperature of the laser adjust the cooler by cooling or heating try to maintain the laser temperature constant okay so that job is done by the thermoelectric cooler and you have a slow start regulated dc power supply why because you should not have a transient power on power off to a laser as i told you being 1000 dollars kind of thing you can't afford to lose it so you should compulsory have a slow start power supply to this laser modules so this all has in a laser transmitter in addition to the rf input to this driving current okay laser selection you have different types of lasers in the market you have dfb laser distributed feedback laser fabry perot laser which is a multi mode laser dfb is a single mode laser vertical vertical cavity laser diode is cheaper and good enough for smaller applications and then wavelength you have to look into it like what is the spectral wave hello okay so wavelength you have to see that the spectral wave the drift in wavelength suppose you are using a wavelength multiplex system if the wavelength drip, uh, drift it will switch from one channel to another channel so you sir, should sorry to interrupt you. sir i'm sorry to interrupt dr khan please please make your video off dr mz khan please make your video <coughs> off okay so the wavelength uh, drifting with temperature is one another issue that you have to verify i will show you why it is important then optical power output how much power you need when you buy a laser like we have used a 22 km distance you need a sufficient power to pump up so we have selected like around 10 milliwatt laser and then there is one other thing a direct modulation or an external modulator system what i am showing now is a direct modulation system then other important thing in rf or fiber is how much noise generated by the laser itself this is called rin noise or relative intensity noise the lower is the best and we are using around 165 dbm per hertz and then the slope efficiency how much current you need to modulate i mean to i mean uh, to get the optical power so it is like current versus optical power the slope efficiency higher the slope efficiency better the efficiency of the conversion there and then sensitivity to optical reflection what happens is these lasers when not only emit radiations when there is a reflection coming back to the laser it tries to create a standing wave pattern in the fiber and try to generate a ripple in the noise floor of the rf channels i'll show those figures so optical reflections towards the laser is one which has to be prevented so nowadays dfb lasers comes with built in optical isolators which is 30 db isolation then lasers whether it is cooled or uncooled you have to decide and whether the laser could modulate your desired frequency range now switching to challenges 
this is what an important thing what are the challenges in using an rf4 fiber okay nowadays you can find a cable tv person uh, provide a cable connection with uh, rf4 fiber system okay but he don't understand all these things but when you try to use them use similar system to a radio astronomy you need to understand these parameters one is amplitude and phase stability performance because the radio stream signal coming from your telescope your fiber optic system should not create a amplitude variation and a phase variation added to the signal then the purpose of the signal transport system is lost then higher dynamic range when a signal comes when i told you the fiber optic system is broader in bandwidth and your receiver is broader naturally heavy amount of rf power will come in and your rf or fiber should have a sufficient range to operate in linear range okay then the noise figure of the rf or fiber system how much noise this itself adds but one good news with this is that since the signal transport system comes after the lna the noise figure of fiber optic system doesn't affect much to your thesis because it's almost uh, freezed at the lna stage itself okay so noise figure is not much important uh, for the rf or fiber system or the signal transport system after the front end okay you can take that advantage but still you can keep it lower and i'll show you how to do that then optical induced reflections in the fiber okay it could be an a reflection in the link due to a connector or in the fiber itself which could be a due to raleigh back scattering happening along the fiber cable between the transmitters and receivers okay then the reliability of the link and optical budget how far and with what uh, what do you call uh, what margin you can provide the fiber optic link is also important in a rf or fiber link design okay so i'll show you the function of an apc control this slide uh, uh, on the right side you can see the laser characteristic x axis shows the current and y axis shows the optical output power suppose the laser temperature is at 0 degree you can see the first curve when the laser temperature moves to 25 degree the second and a 50 degree a third curve and you try to bias your laser at 60 milliampere current okay to get a 8 milliwatt power at 0 degrees at 25 degree you can see only the second curve applies to you and the power is uh, less than 5 milliwatt when it goes to 50 degrees you will operate at the third curve for the same 60 milliampere current and the power is less than 2 milliwatt so it is important to ensure to maintain a constant temperature of the laser at the transmitter so to have a by having a constant temperature you are ensuring constant output optical power from the laser diode this itself will assure you amplitude stability of your link if this optical power varies then your amplitude stability is lost so naturally you should ensure that the laser is cooled as well as you try to correct the current as the temperature varies to maintain the optical output power constant so this is where the optical power control circuit of the transmitter comes in so the graph on the left side you can see that the pink curve shows the temperature variations of the laser and the red uh, blue uh, sorry red curve shows the corresponding laser bias current so when the temperature goes down the current increases when the temperature goes high the current decreases and it tries to maintain the blue curve which is the optical output power so the apc control of the optical transmitter ensures you get an optic optical power stable and hence you get a amplitude stability in a rf over fiber optic system then coming to the phase stability which is an another parameter you can see to the system only with the apc control the temperature curve is a black curve and uh, 
the pink uh, blue curve is a phase variation you can see that the phase also rams along with the temperature variation of course there is a shift in the temperature due to time constant but the magnitude is constant you can see that rf magnitude is constant what we are talking about rf and phase uh, amplitude and phase of a rf signal you can see the pink curve is having a constant amplitude okay or constant magnitude with the mpc control is achieved but we have not done the phase stability now going to the next graph when you try to bury the fiber underground at a depth of 1 meter uh, on the ground what happens is the fiber cable sees one less than 0.2 degrees celsius over 24 hours of time that is a good news for a buried cable so we try to use a buried cable for interconnecting the remote antenna to the central electronics building and the right side curve shows you that there's a gradual phase variation with frequency over uh, this is w4 yeah over 14 kilometer uh, this is 22 kilometer loop back so it's a over 22 kilometer fiber distance link the phase variation is very gradual and it doesn't vary as you have seen in the earlier curve okay because the phase variation is taken care by burying the cable underground okay so what are the parameters which contribute to the phase variation we think that only the thermal expansion of the cable which actually gets affected there are various things the refractive index of the fiber also changes with temperature the laser wave with the temperature the laser bias current can change the laser wavelength could change with lifetime the dispersion of the fiber with temperature can change okay the polarization mode dispersion can change all to put together you get around 9.96 into 10 to the power minus 11 uh, seconds uh, is a delay over 20 km fiber link so when you convert back to phase okay for a 1 uh, gigahertz signal over 20 km distance it is around 35.9 degrees degrees but the variation is too small with temperature i mean it's a gradual change with temperature they do vary but it is gradual why i am mentioning it gradual in the sense because radio astronomers they try to calibrate the antenna in very frequent shorter intervals this is for over 24 uh, hours but radio astronomers try to calibrate it for every 5 uh, minutes or 2 minutes something like that so in short duration calibrations are happening so this phase variation slow phase variation does not affect in using radio i mean rf or fiber for radio astronomy application that is the advantage is taken at gmrt in low frequency uh, telescope okay now coming back to the dynamic range in optical fiber the dynamic range is of two types one is that the optical dynamic range and the optical uh, rf dynamic range so i have plotted here a curve for minus 3 dbm input to minus 15 dbm input you can see that a curve which is red or brown in color the second curve is for minus 5 dbm and uh, x axis shows the input rf power and y axis shows the output rf power okay you can see that linearity the curve is linear from my minus 45 dbm input power to minus 10 dbm okay so you can see that there is about uh, 35 db okay am i correct yeah 2 3 4 yeah around 35 db or more you can get it or if you use a blue curve you can go from minus 50 to like minus uh, 15 dbm kind of thing so <clears throat> what we do is we try to choose the larger Uh, dynamic range in the optical which is minus 5 dbm so that minus 5 dbm is a power given to the photodiode receiver okay that is the power which is mentioned but all transmitters are transmitting equal power and all receivers are obtaining the same minus 5 dbm power for all 30 antenna and over 
irrespective of their distances <coughs> now in radio astronomy there is one one another technique is that in upgrade we are used we don't bias the input power uh, point selection point not at the middle of the linear region we try to do closer to the end of the linear edge region so we try to do a like at a lower input power level so when there is an rfi what happens is the, the signal rises and the system without saturation it can increase very easily but the lower limit will ensure the required signal to noise ratio for the signal processing so we don't operate at the middle of the linearity curve we operate at the bottom most of the linearity curve so that we have a larger headroom in the presence of radio interference to the telescope this is the linear performance characteristic we characterize our system for p1 db for a different bandwidth than ip3 and uh, ip2 also normally the broadband systems uh, it is said that the ip2 is more important than the ip3 and uh, coming to the noise figure we have discussed about dynamic range coming to the noise figure there are different types of noise in a system we have a laser noise a short noise and a thermal noise laser noise is generated in the by the laser photo no, photo noise i mean short noise is by the photodiode and the thermal noise is the receiver with the photodiode so you can see three different types of curve the yellow one is a faint curve you can maybe see it the faint faint curve you can see that based on the optical laws the noise power okay for or the um, when there is a 0 db power to the receiver okay on the right side you can see the noise laser power is very high at a lower power of minus 10 dbm the noise power is lesser and same way the pink curve tells you the short noise short noise increases with optical power and the blue curve is constant irrespective of the optical power it's a thermal noise naturally it will be constant and the total noise is the blue curve i mean the very light blue curve which is increasing combining all three okay we operate at a region okay well below minus uh, well at, at minus 5 dbm so that we operate at thermal region we are not operating at the short noise region or a high power not at a laser uh, noise region okay it is a thermal noise region we are operating so this is the equations so just for nose purpose so the snr degradation also you can see that the snr is constant irrespective of the optical loss in the fiber optic link because we are operating in the thermal noise limited region okay but the by uh, increasing the optical power um, okay or the uh, okay so it is about the snr i'm just uh, taking to the next point the noise figure of an pre amplifier so if you see this curve um you can see that the noise figure of a fiber optic system there is one another problem is that people don't wanted to encourage rf or fiber for a radio astronomy purpose because the noise figure is high and they try to close their eyes but when you try to use an amplifier before it naturally the noise figure goes down but our amplifier in a radio astronomy center is or in a radio telescope it is the lna okay the lna normally brings the the further down the chain the noise figure down in addition we try to put a before the optical transmitter and an amplifier to match the power level between the front end system output and the input of it but you can see the performance the pink curve shows the noise figure is well below okay with a pre amplifier and the yellow curve shows the noise figure added with a post amplifier and a blue curve without any amplifier this is only the fiber optic system but when you put the lna all these things doesn't matter much <coughs> gain with the optical receiver yes there is an optical loss the gain keeps reducing and it goes that for a 1 db optical loss a 2 db um, rf signal drop will be there and optical noises as i told you that the optical intensity induced noises when there is a connector and these connectors when they try to mate and those planes are reflective at the joint 
they will try to produce this ripple in the noise floor along with your signal and this periodic signal is due to optical reflection which is nothing but an external cavity built by this reflection to the laser diode if you see the spacing between these two peaks and you use the formula f is equal to c by 2 nl okay that l will be the distance between the laser and the reflecting point so and you use an optical isolator or a better ultra low reflection connector this ripple dies out okay and thereby you improve your snr same way when you put a fiber link connected to a rf or fiber system for a 14 km distance you can see that there is a random noise along with the carrier there so these are relic back scattering happening in the fiber which produces these noises in the receiver output but when you put a ultra low reflection connectors optical isolators before the laser and low reflection photodiode okay the photodiode also you should have like minus 45 dbm input return loss optical input return loss then the relic back scattering dies out and you see a very clean noise flow and your snr improves uh, like about 20 db and we are experienced it in our far away antenna the other point is that an optical budget as i told you the optical transmitter power the receiver sensitivity or your operating operating point and the components in between them like a mux d mux field joints or the fiber joints fiber connectors all those add to the optical loss and your margin gets reduced why margin in case there is a sudden increase in loss your margin will try to support it so that you can establish your link without any problem okay so in a radio telescope this brings the reliability of the link okay when you are transmitting a calibrating signal for example a clock signal kind of thing a phase noise is an important parameter in an optical system what we have with us is like um, about for 1 kilohertz we see that minus 100.84 dbc per hertz and for larger bandwidth it is shown there so the phase noise response is one you have to see when you are transmitting a reference signal from one point to the another point for any application okay coming to the uh, uh, the actual systems gmrt has in house developed an optical transmitter and receiver which is using dense wavelength division multiplexing okay and works for 3 gigahertz bandwidth and high dynamic range and support 40 km distance and the overall system uh, for antenna report remote application is about 1600 dollars without multiplexing only transmitters and receivers now the architecture as i told it's a very interesting thing when the telescope was upgraded they don't want to leave the old system which carry the if chain so we try to combine the old down converted signal to wavelength lambda 3 and then the new broadband signal again tapped from the same front end and uh, antenna lambda 1 and 2 right circular polarization left circular polarization and then a one spare so we have a four channel optical multiplexer brought on to a fiber at 1550 nanometer okay you have matched three rf channels wide band rf channels one supporting the older system and two supporting the new broadband system combined at 1550 and pass through the fiber to the receiver room over 22 km distance and at the receiver you try to demodulate them you take the broadband chain and you take the if chain and give to the legacy system and process it so there are two receiver chains in gmrt which is happening now the thing is that on one same fiber we try to send a reverse signal for below synchronization of the whole system control and monitoring purpose also in 1310 nanometer so there is a signal traveling in the opposite direction on the same single fiber using a bidirectional technique using wdm coupler and the signal goes from the control room to the antenna so this way this particular network supports dwdm system on single fiber along with a bidirectional link on the same fiber so this is a interesting thing nobody has done it this is very common in digital ethernet links 
but we are adopted in the RF or fiber optic link. How the signals? You can see about 22 channels being received through RF or fiber from various distances like southern arm, western arm, eastern arm, central square. You can see an L band signal along with mobile signal at 950 megahertz peaking there. Okay, so this is how a radio astronomy signal is received at the uh, central electronics building where the signal is sent for further processing. Okay, <clears throat> then in fiber optics, we have done much more interesting thing. These units are bulky, but when we try to use a phased array system, okay, we have a lot of elements in a phased array antenna, but providing a back plane through fiber, you need a very compact fiber optic modules and using an RF over fiber is a challenge. And we have done that. We have built 60 optical transmitters and supported a 144 phased array antenna with 60 connectivity. You can see in the graph, 60 small chassis are integrated. Okay. And these 60 channels reach the signal processing station. And the weight of this is like 116 grams. That's all I can tell you. And the cost is too less. And this uncold laser, we have tried it. It is successful and people are using it. And the receivers, we combine it in the, they are also very quite small, low cost. We combine it in the single processing station and they try to use it. So building a fiber optic backplane for a phased array antenna using RF or fiber was a challenge and we could easily do it. And this uses uh, special connectors for connectivity because you need a dense packing here. Okay. The end of the story is that what happens to this signal? We are brought with a lot of difficulty all the way. Okay. So as far as uh, in simple words, I can put it like you get the signal from the fiber optics output. You try to digitize them first. Okay. An antenna signal comes in a particular channel. You digitize them first. And then you try to do a delay correction because antennas are distributed at different locations. These signals come at different time delays. So what you do is you take the far away antenna and equalize its delay with the, uh, by adding delays to the nearby antennas and try to equalize them in delay and get the signal in time from all antennas. So there is a delay correction happening to the incoming signal. Then what happens is that you have one, you have to do a FFT. Okay. When you do a fast Fourier transform, you try to get this signal digitized, delay corrected into small spectral channels. Okay. Like in our spectrum analyzer in RF, you have a resolution. This also get a fine resolution in FFT. Now the thing doesn't stop here. The fourth state, you take one channel of this FFT of one antenna, one channel, okay, then you multiply and integrate or accumulate with remaining antennas of the array, okay, which implies a correlation. You try to correlate channel by channel, okay, along with the other antennas and try to get a correlated output. Finally, what you get is an amplitude and phase information uh, spectral channel wise which is getting recorded finally at the end of the um, receiver chain. And later the users actually do a signal processing, I mean image processing to get the source in detail. I think with this I am through, okay, some of the references I put here and uh, much of the basics you can find from web, okay, and uh, our team here Okay, it's quite a smaller team, but each one is specialized in one uh, system, building various things uh, for GMRT. So we all thank uh, the listeners and for the opportunity to the committee members. Now over to Somak and team for question section. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk. So may, may, I, may I first uh, request Shogo to, <coughs> to open up the questions, whatever you have received. Hello, Shogo, can you listen? Yeah, yeah, Shogo, there is yeah. one question. Yeah, please. How to control the face center in case of ultra wide band antenna? 
is it possible to make a stable in two dimension for uwb antenna <coughs> actually phase center correction over bandwidth a uh, larger bandwidth is a challenge you are right actually we try to optimize at the center of the bandwidth and uh, or the other way is your band of interest okay with that you can actually do it but over larger bandwidth is not possible that is true any questions from you sapnin any questions you have received sapnin maybe he is having some problem okay let me then go ahead with the questions what i have received okay. sir can you listen to me yes yeah, sir yeah. so for instance, the very first one what i have uh, received sir please explain how the beam is narrowed if the uh, collective area is increased okay so actually i, I have flashed a um, equation there okay um when when the area is increased okay uh if you see go back to this slide okay one second yeah so the uh, okay um this is a uh, angular resolution there is one another equation i can uh, tell you so much maybe i come back to you that yeah, yeah. next question mm. yeah so the next question uh, what i have discussed that how antenna temperature is important for mm. practical application and the second question second part of the question is how antenna temperature is found by simulation like in hfs or in cst antenna temperature i think by simulation you have to use the uh, values available basically the mm, flux density um flex values with frequencies are available for the radio sources you have to use that s value and try to calculate the um, antenna temperature there okay so you can't um, you have to use this uh, reference s reference the flex reference in estimating your antenna temperature okay the second the, the next question what i have received the dust tampering not affect main low at all the the dust dust tapering not affect not affect main low at all ah tapering does not affect uh, main low okay one thing i can tell you that it has a reduced uh, illumination of the disc uh, dish because you try to narrow the feed uh, pattern naturally you you are not illuminating the entire dish you are trying to have a reduced illumination to the dish so with this the taper uh, efficiency uh, i mean with the taper the uh, efficiency goes down but the question is that effect on main low yes so i don't have answer to that the next question is the does antenna temperature influence noise figure of rf receiver consisting cascaded blocks like lna mixer no antenna temperature is a different as i told you it it actually depends on the wavelength the flux and the aperture okay of the dish it has nothing to do with the receiver but the overall thesis depends on a summation of the antenna temperature and the t receiver okay yeah. so that is the answer to it the next question is what is the basic difference between magic t and ortho mode transducer magic t i i can't say anything but ortho mode transducer is again a three port device like a magic t okay uh, here what happens is one port is circular reception and other two ports are linear receptions and they are orthogonal that is what in trans, uh, ortho mode uh, transducer magic t i couldn't compare yeah the next question uh, what i have this is the what is the limit of the baseline of an antenna 
baseline of the antenna i think i i did not show that um, slide so there is um, one another slide i think i flashed you that mm, one second there is no limit to be frank you can see this slide uh, aperture synthesis you can have one telescope in antenna other telescope in space okay and you can create a large aperture which means that you have a large baseline okay yeah. so baselines you can increase it naturally yeah. yeah next one is that how does tapering affect the directivity and beam width of an antenna i think already you have told it yeah. just a few minutes ago correct mm -hmm. the next one is what is the need for omt why the circularly polarized signals need to be transferred to linear components okay so in gmrt this is a special application where we we are using only linear polarization for l band we don't use circular polarization for uh, l band which is 1000 to 1500 megahertz so we need to use an omt because signal the horn feed receives in a circular polarization and we try to receive it in linear polarization h and v okay that is why an ortho mode transistor is used at gmrt otherwise as you said it's not required then the next question is how do you realize switched filters okay the switch filter is as you said it's a switch okay the switch will have yeah it is like analog multiplexer you can say okay you can form with multiple switches build a analog multiplexer multiple channel is switched to one output channel so and uh, what happens is suppose you have four uh, four filters okay and a band pass filter what we have done here so four narrow band filters is connected to four inputs of the analog mux and uh, the band pass filter is put into the another input of the um, mux there so by switching between them you can do it or you can get a bypass mode where with you can bypass the filter bank or the switch filters okay directly pass through the band pass filter so that you get a full band or go through this individual sub band filters and get uh, narrow band signals so it is built using switches and in simple term it is an analog multiplexer kind of thing yeah the next question what i have received that can i obtain negative noise figure value from lna while measuring with vna measuring noise figure of lna with with, with, with vna negative noise figure he is asking that whether yeah. can can i can i get negative noise figure value while measure from lna while measuring with a vna i i didn't understand what is negative noise figure yeah i th yeah you, you don't get anything like negative noise figure yes yes see what happens is noise figure or noise factor is a input signal to noise ratio by output signal to noise ratio yes so the output signal to noise ratio can equalize the input signal to noise ratio it can be more than that the input signal to noise ratio mm. so the maximum best value is only 1 yeah. okay it can be zero but not zero db yeah zero db yeah mm. and then next question is what is the criteria for choosing antennas and choosing geographical area to build the radio telescope and how ska is useful in radio telescopes okay so it's a general question see actually in building a radio telescope as an engineer i can only say that the radio telescope building location should be an rfi free environment radio frequency interference coming from external should be lower you should not have strong transmitters you should not have much of a population creating lot of interferences with industries and various kind of things producing electromagnetic interference or not not much power line related things producing electrical power line interference so you need a rfi clean environment okay to build a radio telescope that is one thing and selecting an antenna it depends on as i told you that whether you wanted to do in high frequency or low frequency in a very low frequency you can go and dipole array and a beam former you can build in and try to do it or um, you can have a parabolic dish antenna and uh, yeah small hand and horn antennas okay like even students do with uh, the stratosky 
dishes and the horn antennas they try to do sun observations okay so radio astronomy signals there are ways what do you want and what frequency you want you can have a option to it okay they you try to build a very big telescope naturally it involves cost okay for a demonstration even small satellite receivers uh, for use for cable tv i mean uh, tv transmissions i mean tv reception it's okay like uh, tata sky receivers our nsr people have done that or even a uh, dipole antenna is okay but thing is that the collective area should be sufficient enough to detect the signal okay and your receiver should be low noise enough so that at that frequency it should be detectable that is the minimum detectable signal level should be lower because the incoming signal is too weak you should know that you are able to detect the signal by keeping your noise itself low as well as a larger collective area okay that is why i put all these explanations to you you can have your own options ska okay so as i told it it is built um, professor vaidhav would explain to you like it's built in south africa and australia and it actually the location is like how many uh, human being is spotted for 1 km distance or 10 km distance mm -hmm. is what matters you have a very thinnest to population in these zones so that you have low interference in these areas and other thing is that they have a low frequency and high frequency telescopes high frequency telescopes suddenly they use a uh, complete uh, dish antennas okay which is involves uh, high frequencies feed and uh, systems and um, uh, solid reflectors whereas in australia they use a type of broadband dipole antennas dipole antenna arrays which i was telling so and they try to do it is interesting to know about it and uh, we our uh, people if i understand based on my knowledge that we are mostly contributing to the uh, what do you call the control and monitoring system of these telescopes or th of this sk so the software part and then their integration all those things is involved but now slowly we are trying to get into the hardware part also including the uh, feed front end the digital signal processing all those things but the main thing is our gmrt is a pathfinder for the sk other than that i have i don't know much to say on sk on this yes so as a next question is that in case we get a negative gain in case of an antenna say minus 1.5 dbi what does it signify practically is it input impedance matching or the gain is not measured in the main lobe of the antenna but in a side or back lobe please explain no actually the radiation efficiency okay you can check the radiation efficiency okay it is poor okay that is why you are getting negative gain okay it is of no use yeah the next question is are the antennas in gmrt reconfigurable that is can the diameter be increased for the already available antenna if required for lower frequency operation like a 65 meter antenna was made 75 meter by jpl nasa for mars mission uh, actually it is not reconfigurable the 45 meter uh, dish supports from 38 megahertz or 30 megahertz to 1500 megahertz frequency yes. so that is the lowest enough what required for the low frequency telescope and the thing is that this telescope is quite special because it has a seamless coverage the receiver mm -hmm. system can take you around from this 30 megahertz down till 1500 megahertz in fact the 13 30, uh, 30 megahertz systems are in building construction currently it is available from 1000 300 uh, 1030 megahertz onwards to 1500 megahertz okay it is a seamless coverage you can do your observation anywhere between this band okay provided your band is free from any known commercial interferences into the receiver okay so there is no need to configure this antenna for any other frequency but hmm. to go to higher frequency certainly this telescope doesn't support that okay and uh, i don't think it's a configurable and yeah. don't need a requirement to be yeah yeah so the next question is sir whether all the antennas of gmrt are individually connected to the control station by fiber optics 
or they yes. are all connected by a series network to the control station no every antenna has a pair of fiber uh, as a pair of fiber cables so one antenna will have two fibers connected between the antenna to the central electronics building whereas we in the upgraded system we have as i told you in the architecture we have combined all the systems to one fiber and freeing the other fiber uh, for making it totally a digital fiber optic link uh, mm -hmm. design so this second fiber is available for upgrading the uh, gmrt with a totally digital fiber optic signal transport system as well as you can have the uh, rf over fiber system running without any disturbance so yeah. we have two fibers but we are using only one currently and one is meant for future upgradation sir here in this slide that i got a interesting question what is lambda 4 in the network architecture yes. slide lambda 4 is a fourth wavelength basically these wavelengths are mentioned in frequencies 193.0 terahertz is one wavelength then 193.2.4.6 these are the wavelengths in frequencies for this gmrt the fourth wavelength is reserved for rfi monitoring purpose you can actually put a rfi antenna at one of at these antenna sites and try to see the local radio frequency interferences mm. online or in real time at the central processing station and do a adaptive noise cancellation with the signal so this is our future scope so we have kept this open for building this rfi mitigation system the next question is in the context of challenges in rf over fiber phase stability yeah. means phase linearity aspect or something else phase stability in the sense that the phase should be constant when a radio astronomy signal comes into our system you should ensure that you don't introduce any more amplitude or phase variations in the system if the fiber variation or the optical transmitters or the receiver is creating a phase variation then the signal quality is lost because you are trying to record the amplitude and phase of the incoming signal if you add a variation to it then the purpose of this radio telescope is lost so you should ensure that there are no additional phase variations happening in the system and other thing is that within the band the phase is uh, or you can say the delay the delay is constant in the fiber optic system okay yeah the next question is uh, what about the transducer gain and matching condition for maximum transducer gain uh transducer in the sense for what i didn't get yeah i also don't i am just simply reading over there what what is the transducer gain and what is the matching condition for the for having the maximum transducer gain you talk about sir the transducer gain i think that's maybe the sense is about the antenna antenna is acting like a transducer i mean as a sensor sensor of electromagnetic wave okay how do you match it you match through the balance and try to get a better matching to your receiver okay and uh, the gain is that uh, like gain of the feed or a reduced loss in the line okay i think uh, nothing more i can say yeah yeah, yeah it's okay and so the next question is that how how group delay is an important for amplitude and phase stability group delay actually what happens is uh, even in rf systems you make a filter or you make a direction coupler or you make a amplifier everywhere every component adds a delay to the receiver chain because it is a transmission path they add some kind of delay with frequency you should ensure over the frequency each component or module have a constant phase delay okay so the overall phase delay at the end of the receiver for the incoming system will be fixed for a frequency right and over the bandwidth and if it is fixed and we are not varying then it is calibratable if it is varying at random time then it is not calibratable so in the sense that the phase uh, delay or the phase constant okay or the phase delay at every module should be kept constant with time and with frequency okay so the next question is that some in fact i i got this comment is 
the step six in the end of the story slide is not visible. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so. What is that? Yeah. Okay. I also I I do. I'm afraid to touch the screen because I don't want to lose it. So I just kept quiet. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it is now now it is visible. Yeah. Okay. So what people do is that they record the amplitude and phase uh, information of the spectral channels, individual FFT channels. Okay. Then they uh, do either online or offline. Mostly offline. The software called the Apes. Okay. Uh, people try to use the astronomical image processing and try to produce a kind of intensity map and uh, various other images uh, of the radio source. Okay. So it's like basically an offline image processing with the recorded data. Yeah. So the, the next question is somewhat bigger. So he's asking that in radio astronomy, are very wide bandwidth antennas are required? If yes, what is the order of bandwidth are we talking about? And okay. for what reason might one use a very wide bandwidth antenna in a radio telescope? Okay, that's a very good question. Why? Yeah. Because when you have a very wide bandwidth, actually you are inviting a problem. Okay, why? Because when you, the system is, the antenna is very wide, your LNA will receive signal from a wider frequency band and the LNA gets saturated very easily. Okay, so having a narrow band feed okay or to the band of your interest is better to protect to protect saturation of your receiver system that is one thing another thing is that how wider is that any <coughs> feed, you take a dipole feed or a horn feed they specify as percentage bandwidth whatever the center frequency you say 10 percent of a uh, one gigahertz band feed which means 100 megahertz bandwidth so any design have percentage bandwidth a number. You should see that what is the percentage bandwidth of a feed. And that tells you are bandwidth. And all our feeds are octave band feed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The next question is that can we use a parabolic dish and a frequency independent antenna like a spiral antenna as a feed as an arrangement for a very wide bandwidth radio telescope? Ah, see here. And, and that's what I've told various constraints in using for a radio telescope. See, a parabolic dish is there. The parabolic dish needs certain things. Okay, things in that, the beam shape, whether your spiral antenna can uniformly eliminate the dish, whether the beam shape is common for all frequency over the band, what, are, what about the um, edge taper, okay, what is the gain, okay, and what are the side globe level with your feet? So when you try to meet all these requirements of a radio astronomy, any field can be used. In fact, phase array antennas, people try to put at the prime focus and try to do a beam forming with a parabolic dish, which is what we are also on the way. Okay. So in the feed should meet all the requirements of a dish to get a, to meet the radio astronomy requirement. Okay. So the next and, and the, the, the last question is why do we need fiber optic link when the reception is only in meter wave? Uh, okay. See meter wave. Um, uh, okay. Meter wave in the sense that it's a low frequency, right? Yes. Yes. Signal. Yeah. You can use uh, wireless transmission of these signals. Okay. Imagine there are 30 antennas. Okay. Same frequency you can transmit. Okay. That is one thing. And the signal what you have received, you are transmitting it. You can't transmit directly. You have to modulate onto some carrier. Okay. And you should have a modulating license for that, the frequency carrier license. Okay. And this signals could create an overall uh, radio noise in your observatory or an array. Okay. So if there are baseline is very far away, you can use wireless connectivity like uh, Jodl Bank, they were early days using between telescope wireless connectivity, the olden days. But it has a limited bandwidth. Of course, wireless systems are not broadband. It has a narrow band systems. But fiber optics is a broadband system. You can carry a wider bandwidth through fiber. Okay. Naturally, you will have a larger bandwidth means uh, your astro I mean, observation is uh, time is less because uh, you see the screenshot of a larger bandwidth at a time. You don't need 
to scan for various frequencies. Okay, so the fiber being a broadband and wireless being a narrow band are not suitable for a radio telescope and you try to avoid any radiation, that's another part. So wireless is not a suitable solution, whether it is low or high. So the, any other questions, Shopneel or Shogato, you have received? Yes, sir. Yeah. So yeah. there is one question coming from Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Anindya Ghosh asked this question. How to control the face center in case of ultra-wideband antennas? Is it possible to make stable in two dimensions for ultra-wideband antennas? I'm, I'm not sure. I've not worked in that area. But in a parabolic dish like GMRT, we have tried to move the uh, dipole up and down at the prime focus and try to uh, for at every height we are from the dish center we have tried to take on a uh, source deflection and optimize the uh, height the, uh, of the feed from the dish center okay that is how we do the um, it's a one dimensional to be correct the height only is the thing not a two dimensional thing and the structure itself ensures it is right at the uh, center. We need, we need not actually move left or right uh, to that, but we do only one dimensional height increase or decrease at the prime focus. And I have no idea about the other multi dimensional movement of the face center. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so what are any other question you have received? Hello, so what are, can you listen to me? Yeah, so what are, you are mute. No, so what? Yeah, yeah. Have you have you? Yeah, so no other? more question. Okay, okay. No, no, no. Only single question there. Okay, no okay, more. okay. So I think that uh, yeah. So we have come to the end of this particular session, and it was really a very nice lecture by Sir. And uh, I since it was very nicely he has elaborated the complete design and all the architecture uh, network of the GMRD system as well as the complete system of an RF over fiber. So it was really very wonderful session. So thank you, sir, for your uh, for your pleasure thank for you, giving us this time. And we are indeed very happy to have you amongst us and uh, to, to uh, spend some time. And uh, may I request Shapnil as well as Shogata to say something before we formally end up? Yes. Uh, thank you, all the participants. Thank you, JMRT. Thank you, IIT Varanasi, for organizing this wonderful event and being with us. Thank you, everyone. So, yeah, I thank the committee members for this opportunity. It's yeah. nice uh, to work on this. In fact, um, with uh, no uh, data in my hand to organize for this talk, but I uh, try to manage with these uh, slides newly made for this talk. Okay, it was very wonderful. It was very, very wonderful. <laughs> In fact, in fact, many people have asked me regarding the sharing of the slides. So I, sure. I don't. Know. So, so it is up to you. If you if you permit, then means then if you can mail me or Shobhato or Shopkin, then only we can share it. Yeah. Okay. So whatever um, uh, I mean, there are other colleagues' works also involved. I'll yeah. Just check back, and uh, I can yeah, yeah, sure. send an edited sure, slide. Sure. Sure. So, sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. thank you for the opportunity. And yes, and thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, for for agreeing to our proposal. And may I may I put my heartiest thanks to Shobhato that who had coordinated yeah. from our behalf that because he was the bridge between us and you, so that uh, it can be done. Uh, it can be arranged in much more fruitful way. So yeah, thank you. So yeah. this is the thing, and uh, and actually that the most of the hard works have been carried by Shopnil Shobhato and. Our student volunteer. Yeah, I can see that. I can see <laughs> yeah. the way it is organized. A lot of effort has been yeah, put yeah. by your committee members. So whatever I'm very much thankful. Yeah. yeah. It is between the means whatever our student members they have only done this particular one. So I was just seeing that before I end up, I was seeing that Dr. D C Pandey was among us. Pandey sir, can you listen to us? Um, I think he has left. I yeah, I think he has left okay. the meeting. So otherwise, I I could have invited him for one minute for these comments or something. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank, thank you, sir. For thank you listener. for all all this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very thank, you. Much. thank you, sir. Thank you, Shumo. Thank, thank you, Shopil and Shobhi, and especially we need Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Otherwise, it will be what will be. This.
we will not <laughs> yeah Okay. And, and I already have shared the feedback form. I am telling to all the participants, I am already have shared the feedback form over here. So please fill it up among uh, as, uh, this one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.